Welcome to Money Conversations with KJ. KJ is a lifelong entrepreneur who's made a lot of money, lost a lot of money, and found his way back again. If you're looking for a sterile how-to, you're in the wrong place. KJ and his guests will walk you through real-life situations told by the people who live them, and they are as messy as they are inspiring. Each episode will offer lessons learned, advice on how to replicate successes and avoid pitfalls, and a new perspective to power your financial literacy. Far from a one-size-fits-all, this podcast can help you build a roadmap to your personal promised land. Milk and honey for some, whiskey and steak for others, and remind you that you're not alone on this journey well hello hello everybody welcome back to the show money conversations with kj i'm your host kj and today in the studio i got mr david nieves he's been on before and we want to chat to you guys today not about dave's story because you heard that but dave is also in the real estate industry he's in the title end of the business, but we always are seeing and talking to people about money, about purchasing or trying to purchase homes. And we want to kind of go over that with you guys today and hopefully teach you a few things, maybe a little aha moments on, on what your your thought process was and what's going on today in the real estate world. So welcome to the show, Dave. Thank you. Thank you for having me, KJ. Awesome. So Dave, we were talking just before we got started here about the mindset. I, I'm seeing people out there. I'm hearing, reading articles, uh, more so the millennials, but a lot, a lot of other people too. Like they're waiting for the market to crash before they die, uh, before they buy. Right? What would that look like? Well, I think a lot of people think that uh, we're going to see it drop like it did in 08. And there are how many indicators telling us this? I don't see any indicators telling us this. I mean, there's no inventory. The, the people have to be extremely qualified to buy a house. Um, so some of those are the, the, the two big factors. I mean, that was a big factor in 08, right? That people weren't really qualified for the loans. That right. They were, they were bad they were, loans. Correct. That's not the case today. And then today people have equity in their house. There's not a lot of inventory. So I don't see what's going to cause prices to go down. Like we were just talking. So a mutual friend of ours is telling you, oh, I, I'm going to wait until the tell a market crashes and then I'm going to go buy. Right now, people have been telling me this for the last five years. And I run back into these people from two years, three years, four years ago. And I said and I tell them, I'm like, do you wish you would have bought four years ago? Cause you're still waiting. Right. And they're like, I'm still waiting. It's going to happen. I'm like, it's not going to happen, bro. There were no indicators. There are good. There, it's, it's hard to get a loan. You got to have your typical good credit money and job, right? You can't just sign on that line and people, even if you just bought a year ago, you got in a lot of areas around the country, 20%, 25% equity in one year. Yeah. That's, that's a lot of money. Yeah. As high as 30%. So worst case scenario. So there's no foreclosure, big massive foreclosure thing coming down the pipeline because worst case scenario, you lost your job or something happened to you and you have to sell your house. You're going to sell and walk away with a few bucks. My experience is that during the pandemic, all the foreclosures, notice of, uh, notice defaults. of defaults, all the, all those different types of, um, situations that people could get into with you know with their mortgage they were like it felt like they were suspended because the courts were closed or they were backed up and now it feels like there's still some sort of litigation where they're not really you know there there seems to be a, a quite a few notice of defaults there seems to be you know a lot of uh well i i, I look look my uh, i get the 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 notices of how many notice of the nod letters are going out on a weekly basis and just here in Vegas, seven to 10. Really? That's it. So no, it's not happening, right? Mm -hmm. The government during the pandemic, right? Had that moratorium for people not to pay, you know, couldn't pay mm -hmm. their mortgage slash or rent. And what they did was they went to the banks and the banks were giving options, right? And the, the one option that people were all taking was, hey, whatever I'm in the rears, six months, eight months, 12 months, whatever it may have been, put that in the rear end of the loan. I'm going to start up again fresh next month. Right. So they didn't have to worry about catching up. Mm. Right. They just start. Also, the numbers now reflect that a lot of people think that that was a, a lot of people that were in that boat that weren't paying their mortgage mm -hmm. for up to a year, or year and a half or even two years. Right. Mm -hmm. The reality the numbers come in very low percentage of people didn't pay. 
it um like some somewhere in the neighborhood don't 100 percent quote me on this but I'm, it was is in the mid 60 percent 65 68 percent of people started to pay their mortgage again only after three months Mm. Right. So they didn't go a long time. And that's why there's no big, massive foreclosure wave coming like people who aren't educated and don't keep up on what's going on. They believe, oh, there's going to be a big, massive foreclosure wave happening and all these houses are going to be for sale cheap. And I'll wait till then to buy. It seems like um, even the people that did fall in the rears are working on some kind of a program. So, yeah, I think that, you know, what, what I was saying is. That there isn't that much distress because even the people that did fall behind seem to be working some sort of a program or they have some kind of a deal worked out with their mortgage or their bank. Like you mentioned, there is a lot of different programs available for people to continue in their house, not like in 2008. Well, let's talk about that, right? The programs that are available out there. Now, I was watching, I believe it was 60 Minutes the other night, where millennials, young millennials, are between 20 and, say, 25, roughly, are a little distressed that they can't buy a home, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, could be price point, could be mainly they don't have the down payment. And what they need to do is get with a good agent, like myself and my wife, who can share with you the programs that are available to you, every state's different, mm-hmm. that um, there are down payment assistant programs that the state slash government will give you the down payment. Now, there are conditions with this, right? Nobody's giving you something for nothing, right? Now, the conditions are this on some of the programs where, okay, we'll give you the 3% down, which could be 10 to 20, I think 20,000 maximum is what they'll give you. Now, the only caveat with that is you must live in that home minimum three years or you have to pay it back. But most people are like, well, I can do three years. You can do three years anywhere. Three years is quick, right? And then that's forgiven and you don't have to give it back. But you do in some cases, there's enough money in there that will cover the closing costs and in some cases not. So even closing costs, if we take um, a $350,000 home. Now, when I say home, it's not necessarily a single family home, right? We're talking about condominiums and townhomes, right? Closing costs. I would figure for you out there trying to save your money to get into a home, to start building equity, making your money, make money, um, five to seven thousand. Save five to seven thousand and then utilize the down payment assistant programs that are available all over the place and get yourself in a home. That's achievable. Achievable, right? Because think about the people two years ago that were telling us, hey, I'm waiting. I'm going to wait. <clears throat> what did they lose out on? They lost out on, They lost out between 20 and 40% of equity growth. With that bit of information, it's like it, it's, it's literally a roadmap where someone can, you know, working at Amazon or, you know, there's at, at any job can put themselves on a plan to say, hey, I'm going to put to aside for $7,000. In the meantime, I'll start working with this realtor. I'm going to start working into these programs, start looking into these things, see what I need to do to qualify. So that's that's very achievable. I think it's a lack of information that people just look at the hill and they say, man, a house is the average home price right now is almost $500,000. I work at Amazon. I make $18, $20 an hour. I work 40 hours a week and I have a site and I barely have, and I don't have $40,000 and I'm not going to have $40,000 in 2022. So there's no way. But if you're sitting there and you were able to say, no, 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 here, here's what we're going to do. Instead of you going out to lunch or whatever, right? The typical thing you always hear, but it's so true, especially today. I went and got two coffees at Starbucks. One of them was just a regular coffee. As a matter of fact, they didn't even put cream or sugar in it like I had asked them to. My bill was $8.06. Wow. For two coffees. So, you know... This whole thing about inflation, it's a very, very real thing. So when you have a person that is hasn't even never paid a bill or maybe never really had a mortgage and they're listening to the news or they go to their favorite restaurant and they're able to detect a two or three dollar increase on what they you know regularly buy, that really puts them in a in a tailspin. They're like, No, there's no way I'm ever gonna be able to afford a house. How can I ever afford a house? Well, let's break it down because you know, when you we use it, it, I think it, it's all words, right? And you you're describing never gonna be able to afford to buy a house. Now, a house in most people's minds is a single family home, mm-hmm. right? Three, four bedroom, whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. Now, 
People never say, I'm never going to be able to afford condominium. I'm never going to be able to afford a townhome. They don't say that. They say house. Now, for you guys out there that have never purchased anything, buy a townhouse, buy a condo. There are condos in, we were in Vegas. There are condos in Vegas that you can buy for 200 grand, right? 250,000. Today, are there? Yes. Okay. Yes, there are. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Right? You can get a little two bedroom, two bath condo for, for uh, 200. Right now, the thing is, today it's two hundred in two years. I think it'd be worth two seventy five. Guess what? You got seventy five k in equity, right? And if you're using the down payment assistance program, you live there three years, and you could have a hundred, hundred twenty five thousand equity. Guess what you do with that equity? Now it's time to roll up. Hey, you know what? We're gonna go ahead and sell this thing now. I'm past my 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 period that I have to stay here three years. I'm gonna go buy a single family home, but I got one hundred twenty five thousand equity. That's going to go directly towards the down payment of a single family home, right? So there's always a way to get things done if you can educate yourself, right? And now people talk about credit scores. I work with a couple of different lenders that tell me you could be as low as 580 and qualify for a loan. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean you're getting the lowest rate available at that time. You're probably, your rate's going to be a little higher, but think that the cost of the cost of of building wealth right even if you pay an extra point because your credit's not great right now work on your credit get it up refi in 12 to 18 months right get that payment lowered a little bit the name of the game is to get in the game get in the game making money while you sleep through equity it is a beautiful feeling and it's great and it's something that you know everybody tells you when you're young oh you know one day you're going to get old and you're going to want you're going to want these things you're going to want to have that availability or that flexibility and um, nobody nobody takes a discipline i don't think we live in a culture that well i think i heard it today it's like we want everything now well yeah instant gratification for everything um but people are trying to figure out how to make money what do i got to do Building equity in your own personal home, having write-offs is a great way to start doing that. There's a lot of other ways to make money. We won't get into that today. But today we want to talk about how we can help people change their mindsets, understand that you can get into a home even today, even with rates where they're going, even with the market where it's where it's at right now, right? There are places that you can buy that will grow every year in equity and grow you some money. There's a certain level of safety and security that comes from owning a home. You're, you're, you'll feel it. Your family will feel it. Um, there's, there's that level. I don't know what, I don't need, I, I know I've mentioned it to you in the past. It's like my parents always owned real estate and I felt like I had an extra layer of protection more so than my friend that lived across the street from me. I didn't think I was superior to him. I didn't think I was different than him. I just felt like I had a different, I had an added layer of protection. Who wouldn't want to give that to their child? First of all, second of all, who wouldn't want to give that to themselves or to their spouse? And then the, uh, the thing, you know, that's, so that's one motivation. The other motivation that I keep thinking about, cause like you mentioned, I work in the title industry and part of my job is to work with realtors and help them grow their business. Right. And in doing that, a lot of them right now, because of the low inventory, they find themselves calling people that have expired listings that um, are have a notice of default that or whatever the case may be. They find themselves on the phone calling these people and cold calling them and saying, hey, and they have a script and they're trying to generate motivation or see what their motivation is and actually listing and selling a home. And I come over and I tap them on the shoulder and I say, hey, have you called any just sold? And they're like, just sold. Yeah, people that just recently bought a house three years, in the last three years. Because those people just have $100,000 in equity. And they may or may not know that. And if you call and share that information with them, you may get a listing. So to your point, Kevin, absolutely. People want to get involved in real estate now rather than later because... Had you done that, you, does everybody remember when they told us that we're going to flatten the curb and we're only going to be out of work for two weeks? Mm-hmm. Had you purchased a house then on that day, today you'd be six figures richer. Yep, absolutely. Um, I think it's, you know, if we, we I've talked to people, we think about it, we see what the market's doing. It all has, it just boils down to just one word, which is fear, right? It's fear, um, fear of the unknown, fear of loss. Fear of I can't do it. Um, and 
education can take away that fear, right? Talking to the right agent who really understands the process of buying a home and how they can really help you. Not every agent does because they don't do their homework, right? They just want to fill out some paperwork, get a house sold or listed and move on to the next one. Uh, But really, there's a lot of different ways to help people get in a home if you're talking to the right agent. Uh, because there's a lot of programs out there. Trust me, the government wants you to own a home. They, they really do. And giving, putting all that money up there in, in those programs for the down payment assistance is proof that, you know, they're putting their money where their mouth is kind of thing. So for a lot of you guys that are out there, listen, start inquiring, talking about it, talking to people. If you know someone who just bought a house, say, hey, how did you do it? Right. Did they have the full uh, minimum 3% down. A lot of people are 10% down today, right? Hey, where'd you get the 10%? How long did it take you to save it? What'd you do to save it? I mean, this is what I like to talk about money with people need to ask other people, Hey, what did you do Mm -hmm. to be able to afford to get into a house? I think it's a lot easier today than it was when, um, I was younger. I remember when I was younger, there was a Johnny Carson song Mm -hmm. and Johnny Carson was like the main late night host. There was about four channels. I I was raised in LA There was probably 13 channels, but whatever compared to the amount of channels we have today, it felt like we had four and Johnny Carson was a main figure at night and his etiquette and his culture was like, don't ask him what things cost. You know, if he had a new car, if he had a Rolls Royce or if he had whatever, you know, it's nice. It's beautiful. You can give him that compliment, but don't say, hey, because that wasn't part of the culture where he was raised. And it wasn't it wasn't part of the culture in the 70s. Now we live in a in a culture that's way more communicative. We share information a lot. I mean, we're social platforms and everything. It's not uncommon for people to say, oh, that's a $300,000 or whatever, or that to give you the price, because why could we go on our phone and we could find out exactly what it costs. So we have these, we have this dialogue about money. That's a lot more fluid than before. Before it's like, it was impolite to talk about money in that way. Do you find it personally to be impolite? If someone talks to you or asks you about money? No, not at all. I mean, I was raised, I was raised to to you keep that to yourself you don't talk about that and then i learned later in life through education and you know i've always been an open-minded person it's funny i i I just listened to this one individual talk about how he could change his mind on the spot and i feel i'm the same way if you give me a point and your point makes sense to me and i could digest it i'm I'm not going to sit there and hold my my decision to an emotional thing if it makes sense you gotta you gotta you gotta go with it and it makes sense to discuss financial matters with other people how else are you going to learn different strategies well i talk about that in my program under the tradition uh module that i teach right tradition parents tell you don't ever tell anybody how much money you have right right whether you got 10 cents or 10 million don't ever tell right and like you said i don't find it to be rude to talk about money what people what you don't need to tell people is exactly what you may have at whatever point in time that you're going to have a discussion right i've got one hundred and twenty seven thousand five hundred and sixty four dollars and seventy two cents in the bank right now right you don't need to tell anybody a number you can share and i think we have an obligation uh to our fellow man to share hey listen i did really well doing xyz it could have been an investment it could have been, um, well, you know, I volu- I last year I did an average of eight hours a week overtime, and with that money was what allowed me to buy this house. That's how I bought it. And then it te- what it does, it shows people like, okay, so he really wanted to buy a house, and he did what he had to do. And in his case, for a year, he did eight hours a week overtime, took that money, put it aside for his down payment, and boom, he bought a house, yeah. right? This is not, there's nothing wrong with t- ha- teaching somebody a lesson like that. Like, that's what they did. And you're like, I think it's motivating. Would you find that to be motivating if someone told, shared a story like that yes, with you? Yes. I think um, I think something happened to us in the, uh, our culture shifted in the, maybe in the late 90s, where we became this society where we want to share all our information. And here's what I found out through that. Um, I don't know if you remember the big revolution with Oprah Winfrey and The Secret. For some reason, I think that right. period of time, all right. of a sudden we became like these gurus across the country not just in one place i'm talking about everybody got into all this like sharing information being abundant open mind i think you're right i think you should give away all your information you know why because only the ones that are going to take action are going to take action only the ones that are going to be successful are going to be successful you can give a person all the information that 
everything. And if they don't want, if they're they're not ready to take it, they're not going to take it. Exactly. They're exactly. Not. No, you're right. You're right. Um, so we've got we've got to share it for the people who want to take action. Well, there's actually multiple. If you think about categories, right? There's there are those who want to listen. There are those who say they want to take action, and there are those who actually take action. Now, I find a lot of the people that don't even say they want to take action are the action takers. The people who talk a big game like, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, don't ever actually end up doing anything. It's the people that don't say anything that listen and learn and then take action and then whatever amount of time goes by, year, three, five, ten, whatever, like, man, look at that person now. Well, they learned and listened. They didn't tell you what they were doing. Now, I so far, everybody I've talked to about would you be open to sharing, right? Would you be open to being a, a mentor at some level? And I really can't be- remember of someone telling me no. Pretty much everybody says, yeah, no, I would love to mentor someone at some level, right? Um, understanding what being a mentor is, and there's different levels of mentorship from people and what you might be willing to do, but... I think if more people would ask people that they know that have whatever level of success and you don't have to ask anybody that's necessarily, you know, a millionaire or whatever. Right. Just someone who's living appears to be living a successful, happy life. Like, hey, what's what's your secret at the end of the day? Is it a secret? It's not a secret. They'll share it with you. Yeah. I mean, most people will. I Yeah. I don't. I don't. For sure. If you ask a person what, what, how, how they, how they, they will more than likely share that information with you. Absolutely. Right. Maybe it's just how they manage their money because maybe you're not managing correctly. You're not sure how to do it correctly. It's many different ways to budget and manage money. And maybe the way someone, you know, who appears to be living life on a higher level, you're like, well, what are you doing? Well, I do this. Right. That's not telling you how much money they have. They're telling you what they do. Mm hmm. Right. So it's not about finding out how much money someone has in the bank. That really is nobody's business, but your own. Right. You share that with yourself and your spouse. Um, But how did I get there and what do I do to grow it? And what do I do to maintain it? It's total great information that we should all share with each other. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I think for a period of time, we didn't do that. We didn't do that. Um, You know why? No. Fear of judgment. I, I've been, i I read this not that long ago, I mean, a couple of years ago that, and I, and I, and I talk about it on my, some, some of the other podcasts I've done is people, there are two kinds of people. You either have money or you don't have money and you don't talk about money um, because you're embarrassed either way. You're embarrassed if you have money, you you don't want to talk about it because you're afraid people are going to ask you to borrow money and nobody likes to lend money, right? Uh, I'll give away money before I lend money. Or if you're on the other side of the coin, you don't have money, you're broke. You're embarrassed to talk about money because you don't have any. And I don't think we should be embarrassed on either side of that coin. No, I agree. I mean, I think you you should be, like I said, it's 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 refreshing. It's good that we're now moved on into a place where it's more it's more acceptable to to have these conversations. You could talk about credit. You could talk about savings accounts. You could talk about retirement accounts. Well, in today's world, there's so much technology out there that uh, can be leveraged compared to the when you and I grew up in our 20s. Um, just apps even, right? Just, you know, mint.com, great app, right? Um, so many apps out there that, that uh, people can leverage to get themselves managing their money better. Um, but listen, that was pretty awesome. I thought this would be a quick one. We're already... Almost a half hour in. So, Dave, the takeaway today is one, let's keep talking about money, guys. Start asking people. I don't think you're going to find people being rude telling you I ain't telling you. I don't think you're going to find that. Two, get yourself in a house. Start growing money. You know, if you're out there living paycheck to paycheck, you can still live paycheck to paycheck, get in a house, grow some equity. Time, the sun comes up every day, I say. And let time go by a year, two, three years down the road. You got yourself six figures. I don't see prices coming down. They're not coming down, folks. I'm telling you, my plateau, if they dip three to five percent, that'll be I I think that'll be the most we'll see. So for you folks out there that are telling yourselves, I'm waiting for the crash. I'm waiting for the crash. I've been telling people for five years. I I talk back to them like not happening. You just cost yourself a couple hundred thousand bucks. So, all right. Thanks for coming out, Dave. For you guys out there, um, listen, follow me on the podcast and on my YouTube channel, Money Conversations with KJ. And we'll talk to you guys on the next one.